the Richard Eastlin needs very little introduction. Um, and obviously is sort of the founding father of the economics of happiness. And he has the uh, incredible paper um, asking, um, does economic growth improve the human lot, which is probably the most beautiful of all titles uh, ever or to have ever come out asking such a poignant and important question. Um, but Dick, I'm going to start with that famous paper in 1974. Um, and I would like to ask you, um, how did you came about thinking about this? How did you came, come across the data in the first place? Um, and what happened? What brought together this amazing paper that I, that I printed out earlier today? And it was really so impressed by because we all cite it. Um, uh, and actually reading properly through it, just how rich it is and, and special in setting us all off on this particular course of thinking about income and well-being. But how did you- It's, not, it's nice to know that it does get read as well as cited. <laughs> so over, over to you, Dick, if you can tell us a okay. bit more about this. Well, it, it really got started very accidentally. Um, I was uh, at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, uh, and uh, they bring together uh, about three or four uh, individuals across the social science, each of the social sciences uh, and allied uh, fields. <clears throat> uh, so it's a, a very inter interdisciplinary uh, uh, environment. Uh, and one day at lunch, uh, I don't know, we were told, I, I, they knew I was interested in uh, long-term economic growth. And uh, uh, one of the sociologists there uh, said, have you ever looked at the data on happiness? That was the first time I had ever heard uh, that there were any data on happiness. Uh, so uh, I jumped on board immediately uh, and uh, I started gathering uh, the, the bits and pieces of data that were available uh, from uh, various scattered sources. Uh, <clears throat> and my uh, natural instinct was uh, to ask how happiness is related to income. Uh, my, uh, and I, you know, uh, in, my, in my day, everybody did uh, uh, the cross section and time series was a big deal. Uh, like the savings income paradox uh, was a famous cross section time series thing. So I, uh, I, I was looking at the data and my expectation uh, was just the reverse of what economists would have expected, namely that uh, more income would make people happier. My expectation was both in the cross section and the time series, it would turn out it didn't work that way. And uh, then to my um, you know, surprise, it worked out like the savings income paradox where in the cross section, the relationship was positive and in the time series, the relationship was nil. So it really got started by accident I was very lucky to be in that environment and learn about those data and also to have the opportunity at the same time of gathering the data, talking about them with uh, the people in other fields, both sociology and psychology. Uh, and even the, the few a couple of economists that were there were, were supportive. Mm -hmm. Dick, I do know that when you were at Stanford was quite some years before the paper actually got published. The paper got published in 1974 in a volume in honor of, of, of another scholar. So can you say a bit about the process of getting this, what now turns out to be a seminal paper? What, how difficult was it to get it published and accepted by economists to be looking at feelings data? Well, you know, I thought it was a pretty good paper. <laughs> so I sent it to the American Economic Review. I got it back almost immediately saying, there's nothing new in this paper. <laughs> so there you go. So I, I found that pretty depressing. And uh, so 
I knew uh, this volume was being put together by Mo Abramovitz about in honor of Mo Abramovitz. And rather than fight, you know, with, with more uh, <clears throat> journals, I just took the easy way out and said, okay, let's let, I'll just submit it here and let it be published that way. Mm. The thing so, I have to, I'm quite surprised to hear that the AER thought this was not novel or innovative. Like, did yeah. they refer to anything like this that was published before? Well, I, 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 I bet the, I, I, I don't think I have the, the, re, the rejection anymore. I probably tore it up immediately. But uh, uh, it was not more than about three or four sentences. Uh, basically, that's what it said. Nothing new here. Uh, so uh, it, it was, uh, since no one had, had ever done anything with data on happiness, it was pretty discouraging to get that reaction. Uh, you know, uh, and it wasn't until uh, I came to USC about uh, 10 years later uh, that Timur Karan sort of explained to me that, well, you know, you're looking at subjective data. Economists don't look at subjective data. Uh, and, you know, I've been so involved in demography that uh, I had sort of gotten out of touch with the standards in economics. So, uh, here I was violating not a basic precept that more income is good for people, but also that you look at, uh, you listen to what people say, uh, not just observe what they do. So uh, well, well, eventually Timur made it clear to me why the paper was uh, uh, not, not getting accepted uh, by economists. Right. So, uh, you know, uh, it, that was uh, uh, the early 70s, uh, and <clears throat> uh, I got invited to give talks uh, on happiness at various places, and usually people were pretty polite, uh, but, uh, you know, basically nobody, no economist thought it was worth talking about much more than uh, cocktail gossip. Uh, so it, it really was went, stayed like that for a long time. Uh, and it wasn't until I think uh, my good friend Andrew Oswald uh, got uh, happiness uh, studies going uh, in uh, economics that uh, uh, it really started to take off. And that was like 20 years. Yeah. I think there may have been one or two papers uh, basically negative that economists published on the topic in the interim. Well, Richard Layer published a positive paper, thank God, uh, but uh, uh, that was probably one of the few. Yes, and in the, in the meanwhile, of course, it was psychology where people like Ed Diener uh, would be working hard and, and a larger uh, crew of people on subjective well-being, but in economics there was nothing much happening. Is there? Yeah. No, uh, and the and the interesting thing was uh, uh, the psychologists were as bad as the economists uh, back when I first got started. On them. There were almost no psychologists. The only uh, it was the people uh, who did uh, public opinion polls uh, that were interested in happiness. And to some extent, uh, there were a few sociologists uh, that were also working in the field. Uh, and they, they, were, they were basically uh, some uh, survey researchers at uh, Michigan uh, that were involved. But uh, it, it was all very peripheral. Uh, and it wasn't until Diener came along that psychologists really started uh, to look at that. And Diener uh, became a central uh, figure in psychology by virtue of uh, uh, focusing attention on these uh, subjective well-being responses. So uh, it, it was nice that, that something happened in psychology, but not in economics at that time. That was the 1980s. Yeah, and then in the early 90s, it was Andrew Oswald and Andrew Clark, who was a student at the time, 
we started picking. Right. And so I think we also owe a lot to Andrew and Andrew for bringing it into mainstream economics or pushing hard on that front and trying and ultimately getting a paper into the American Economic Review. And I know, uh, fantastic. Uh, I asked Andrew how he, how, how he may, managed to do it. He could answer that for himself, but uh, it was sheer persistence. Uh, you know, I, I would never have, have been, had the, uh, uh, that, that uh, degree of uh, keeping at it that he, Andrew had, uh, and he really succeeded. He made them, made them stand up and take, pay attention. Absolutely. Um, Dick, uh, you're known for the Easterland paradox. So I think we have to ask you, can Dick Easterland define the Easterland paradox for us? Sure. Well, I don't know whether economists these days ever hear about the savings income paradox, but it was basically the same as the savings income paradox, uh, that there's a contradiction in the data between cross-section and time series evidence. And in the cross-section, uh, happiness and income are positively related. And in time series, uh, there is no relationship. That was, but that's, that was the substance of the paradox. When we dig a bit deeper into the paradox, there's two specific questions I want to dig a little bit into. One is, um, in the long run versus the short run. So I do think over the years, as, as you and others have worked on, on the Eastland paradox and the time series in terms of uh, the relationship between well-being and income, it is not like it cannot move. It's, but I guess we've come around now that in the long run, and full economic cycles, there is no movement, but that does not uh, prevent um, economic growth impacting in the short run well-being. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, if you think uh, graphically, uh, think of a uh, 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 time series of happiness and income that's fluctuating uh, in the course of time. And when happiness goes, income goes up, happiness goes up. When income goes down, happiness goes down. So the two are fluctuating together. But if you fit a trend line to the two series, uh, you'll find that uh, while income is going up, happiness is not trending up. So the fluctuations uh, in income are occurring around a rising trend line the fluctuations in happiness are occurring around a level trend line. Now that's making it very simple because it's just one picture. So uh, the more substantive test is to think of the trend lines by themselves uh, and then think of a happiness and income trend line for a number of countries. And the question is, well, in countries where income trends upward more rapidly, does happiness trend upward more rapidly? And the answer to that is no. And there are no better examples than China, Japan, and India, each of which has had periods of enormous economic growth, uh, like in China, a fourfold multiplication in 20 years, doubling and redoubling, and pretty much the same in uh, the earlier uh, history of Japan, and more recently, uh, contemporary India. And, and in none of those countries is happiness going up. If anything, it's uh, flat, or in India's case, seems to be trending downward. Absolutely. Um, that's what we find in the World Happiness Report as well. Um, I'm wondering, Dick, though, when we try and explain the issue and paradox, we often move in, in the direction of adaptation. And adaptation can take two forms of so the uh, interpersonal adaptation, so social comparison, known as such, or intrapersonal comparison, also known as the hedonic treadmill. Um, are those the two key explanations? And is there sort of a relative importance between them, or are they equally important? Because I know you've been thinking quite a bit about um, how they compare against one another, how they stack up to each other. And you had some recent thoughts about this. 
Uh, it goes back to your question about the long run and the short run. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, in the long run, uh, if you're thinking about the trend, I, I think inter interpersonal comparison is the dominant factor. Uh, social comparison uh, is having uh, uh, a, a negative effect uh, on people's personal happiness, uh, offsetting uh, the positive effect of income growth. Um, but in the short run, uh, the question is, uh, would social comparison explain that? And the answer is no, that if income and happiness go down together, uh, income is going down and, and for everybody. And so if you were thinking about the effect of social comparison, since everybody else's income is going down as well as yours, it's not offsetting uh, the uh, uh, decline uh, in, uh, it, it's now, it, it, it would offset the decline in income, happiness uh, uh, and income uh, would uh, move together. Let me see if I got it right. Uh, in the, uh, we, uh, uh, income is going down. We would, on the basis of the long run relationship, we would not expect happiness to go down, but uh, if social comparison were at work, it would go down because uh, social comparison would uh, not uh, uh, be exerting its long run influence. The, the, mm -hmm. the, it's, on the short run, I'm sorry this has been uh, not, not well presented, <laughs> but in the short run, intrapersonal comparison comes to, into play. So my view is interpersonal comparison is operating all the time, whether income is going up or down, okay? But in the short run, uh, intrapersonal comparison comes into play uh, predominantly and dominates the effect of interpersonal comparison. And the reason that is, is in the short run, what's happening is incomes are going down uh, and people have uh, fixed financial obligations. This is the biggest reason, uh, at which they have to make payments on, mortgages, uh, loans on automobiles and other household appliances, uh, credit card payments, you name it, all kinds of uh, uh, obligations that people have to make usually monthly payments on. Uh, and once income falls below uh, a person's previous peak, these financial obligations become increasingly difficult to pay. So now you're looking at how your income, current income is comparing with your previous peak income. So there's the intra-personal part of it. And, and as long as income is going down below its previous peak, that dominates any effect of social comparison and has the result of reducing your happiness because your income's going down. You're finding it increasingly difficult to meet your fixed obligations and your happiness goes down as a result. Yeah, and Dick, this obviously links perfectly or maps perfectly onto the notion of loss aversion um, uh, that Danny Kahneman and others. Also absolutely, use. absolutely. And that's what you're seeing in the short run if you go below your previous uh, level of, of income. And luckily, yeah, actually, I think there, there are two articles by Kahneman and Tversky uh, that are uh, fundamental uh, to understanding what's happening with regard to subjective well being. The, uh, the first article is where they say, well, I have to recognize that when people evaluate a situation, they have some internal benchmark. That's something economists have never really uh, even started to recognize in the past. Uh, so the first thing is the importance of an internal benchmark. Uh, and the second thing is uh, uh, 
Well, I forget. <laughs> um, great. Well, thank you, Dick. I think um, I want to take it to your wonderful um, book. So uh, you've obviously published a book recently, um, the first uh, textbook on well-being, even though Richard and I are working on one as well. But this is the very first one um, called An Economist's Lessons on Happiness, Farewell, Dismal Signs. Um, and it essentially, I read through it over the summer, and it's sort of a beautiful relay of the, the course you were teaching at UC, USC on the economics of happiness. So um, I'm obviously putting in a plug for the book, but can you say a bit for that? <laughs> can you say a bit more about the teaching of economics and well-being? Do you see other? Do you see, are people still teaching it? Teaching your course now at USC? Do you see uh, across other universities people? Uh, picking up uh, this particular book or teaching elements or courses fully on well-being and economics and happiness? Is that a growing field of, of teaching? Uh, when it is, uh, uh, then I'll know that, econo that the economics of happiness has made it in the United States. There are very few courses uh, and uh, my course uh, now is no longer being taught uh, for a short time, Maggie Swidek, who uh, worked with me in uh, economics of happiness, was teaching it, but uh, she's gone over to consulting. And so uh, there's no longer an economics of happiness uh, being taught even at USC. Few courses are being taught around uh, the US, but not many. Mm -hmm. no, one, one, obviously, that's no <laughs> is uh, at Yale University, Lori Santos. Um, who had a course that was extra, exceptionally popular, needless to say. Uh, so yes. the, I think the demand from students is certainly there. Uh, but I'm pleased to say that... The students, the students, you know, this was their favorite economics course. <laughs> I, I could have had 500 students if I uh, fell up to teaching that many. Uh, but I limited it to 50. Uh, but the students loved love the economics of happiness because it's talking about the, their personal lives really uh but uh that's not that doesn't affect the economist's choice of what to put into the curriculum no, in the united sad. states yeah sadly no. the good news is that maybe outside the states there is, you, you really see a pickup and people teaching courses on this or at least bringing the material into existing courses on political economy or welfare economics. So it's a, exactly. there's a lot yeah. more and it's starting to cater to that demand that's there by students. And I hope your uh, textbook and Richard and my textbook with Cambridge University Press will, will help that structure that demand and supply. Yeah, um, they're really complementary because you cover uh, the literature uh, very exhaustively, whereas I present a particular point of view uh, but uh, so the two work together, I think, uh, very nicely. I would, I would Let, let's see if we can get the publishers to do that. <laughs> uh, to combine them. Um, well, Dick, maybe just one or two last questions on my end, and then we'll hand it over to anyone who's keen to ask you questions. I'm sure there's many. Um, I am keen to know what you think are sort of the, the topics of the future in well-being research. So what is the research frontier uh, on your, what are the key questions that you would like us to work on, um, for example? I, I really think uh, the key questions are uh, uh, the uh, social welfare policy measures uh, that can uh, influence happiness, I think. Uh, you know, uh, rather than uh, uh, income accounting for uh, the differences across countries in happiness. It's uh, the public policy measures that have been implemented that uh, really uh, address uh, the, the needs of people, the foremost needs of people, uh, having a job uh, and their income uh, security, uh, their family life, uh, taking care of the elderly, raising little children, schooling, and so on, uh, and health. I think those, those types, the measures with regard to those policy areas are the ones that, that need to be addressed first 
and foremost, because uh, until it's the foundation of happiness in those types of actions is clearly established, economists are still going to look at income and say, oh, yeah, well, it has to be income. Mm -hmm. And Dick, in that case, <laughs> you'll be very pleased with the advances on sort of well-being years approaches and others in policy that try to structure and operationalize well-being in policy making to be able to deal with it properly. Oh, uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, the work that's been going on in, in Europe and particularly in Britain uh, is, has been really uh, very encouraging. I don't know, it's like you're light years ahead of the United States as far as I can get <laughs> concerned. Yeah, and the, and the good news on this front is that the Treasury here in the UK has just published an appendix to the green a supplement, technically speaking, to the green book, which is their Bible for doing cost benefit analysis. And so it's a whole supplement with different approaches to integrating well being metrics into policy making. So that's, that's really great. Really great. Uh, it's so encouraging to see uh, governments taking up uh, the collection of happiness data increasingly throughout the world. So uh, that, that's, I think, you know, it's pretty clear that happiness is, I, I, let me back up a little bit. I, I see papers about it by economists about how welfare is affected this way and that way. And welfare was always basically income. Uh, and I, I, gradually, it's it, gradually, very gradually, it's starting to become happiness, much more so when in Europe than in the United States. So in case you hadn't noticed, uh, I definitely have a pro-Europe bias on the field of happiness. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Annette, thank you, Dick. Uh, and as a European, continental European, I'm obviously very pleased to hear that. So thank you. We try our best. Um, I would like to hand it over to anyone who has uh, specific questions. And obviously, thank Dick already for that amazing conversation with us. Um, but do we have um, questions? I see Michael Plant has raised his hand. And we have um, uh, Chris Barrington Lee just adding a little comment here saying that, well, uh, that Canada is going to give the European nations a run for their money on happiness and well-being and policy. So let, let the competition begin on this front. I think we can all benefit. Thank you, Chris. Um, and so maybe over to uh, Michael Plant first, and then um, uh, and then Casper also had some questions put in the, in the chat, and I see also second hand is already raised. So Michael, over to you. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you fine. Mike. Great. Uh, so first, uh, Dick, thank you so much for your work over the many years. I'm enormously grateful, personally, thank you. for everything you've done. Um, so I've been thinking about the you know, your your um, eponymous paradox for a while, and the the thing I'm that I'm wondering about is that it seems like we do have these idea of these these policies which can improve our well being, and it seems like over the course of time we should have some more of them. So, you know, it's sort of extra welfare and uh, and these sorts of things. Um, so on that basis, it still seems sort of mysterious that um, that well-being doesn't really seem to be going up, you know, at least in the, the developed world. So there's this sort of tension between it looks like, you know, on the face of it, there is stuff we can use money to buy or stuff we can do in society. But at the same time, we don't seem to be seeing particular changes. I'm basically curious as to... Uh, as to what's going on, because the the most sort of negative version is, well, look, you know, you know, is, is it just that we could be doing things, but they're not working, or uh, or, or, or something else happening? Uh, well, that's a real good question. Uh, the my view is, uh, if we look at the uh, <clears throat> the uh, country distribution. Uh, by happiness. Uh, there are big differences uh, across the spectrum. And of course, the European countries uh, tend to be, uh, the Western European countries tend to be uh, in the highest ranks. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the, uh, 
And the, uh, the, the problem is that that array uh, was pretty much established prior to the collection of happiness uh, data. So uh, the Nordic countries, uh, which are at the top of the distribution, uh, started welfare state policies uh, in the late 19th century uh, and continued to build on those policies up until uh, the 70s and 80s. Uh, then, of course, the economists started to get into the picture. They said, uh, if you look at the, uh, the economist literature, it's very anti-welfare state. Uh, the, the, there's a wonderful and so Oxford Encyclopedia, I think, of the welfare state. Uh, it's all contributions by political scientists, not by uh, economists, uh, because economists take such a negative view. So what I'm, I'm uh, saying is the current structure uh, of happiness uh, was essentially established uh, by developments uh, before uh, happiness data really started being uh, systematically collected, say from about 1980 uh, onward. That's not to say there aren't some countries uh, that don't show happiness and income going up together. Costa Rica is, of course, an outstanding example. But by and large, uh, the problem is we don't have time series data uh, that go back enough in the case of Europe to show uh, how uh, these policies are paid off. And that's why I think uh, we need much better research on uh, current policies that are likely to be conducive uh, to promoting happiness. Thank you, Dick. Thank you, Dick. That makes a lot of sense. Um, over to Casper and then Chris. Uh, thank you so much, Richard. It's, it's, it's really amazing to have you here. I'm kind of really excited. Um, two questions. First question, and I think that relates to um, your, uh, the answer that you just gave, is what you make of this cross-country, cross-sectional association of income and happiness. Um, is it explained by cross-country reference effects or do you take some other explanation to be the driving force there? And then sort of relatedly to also the welfare state stuff is to me, it seems like welfare state sort of do two things. They reduce income differences and they reduce income volatility. So I wonder, do you, do you see some other role of welfare states there or, um, or is that essentially it? And then final question, if I may, who was that sociologist that got you onto that happiness data? <laughs> the final question is a simple one. Uh, he cited uh, in the footnote to the article, uh, and he was with the Russell Sage Foundation, but I'm ashamed to admit that I don't have his name on the tip of my tongue. <clears throat> Uh, let's go back. What was your first question? Uh, what do you make of the cross-sectional, cross-country association of income? Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, economists love to do cross-sectional studies in which income is related to God knows how many things. I, I, my, my feeling is the relationships that are found with regard to income, including that of happiness, uh, are not at all causal. Now, what we're looking at is, is two discrete phenomena, largely discrete. Uh, income has been increasing in countries uh, across the world going back to about 1800 as the result of the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution is a product of advances in the natural sciences. <clears throat> happiness has been going up across, among a, a, a growing number of countries uh, since uh, I would say uh, the late 
19th century, the late 20th century. Uh, let me get it right. So basically, uh, happiness been, has been going up uh, throughout the 20th century uh, over the long term. And that's the result, not of anything having to do with the natural sciences, it's the result of the emergence of the social sciences and the implementation of policies in the social sciences that improve uh, people's living conditions, uh, their health, uh, and, uh, and so on. So you have two distinct phenomena. One is uh, growth in income based on the natural sciences. One is the growth in happiness based on the social sciences. The thing is that the leaders in both of those developments are the Western countries uh, and especially European countries. So if you take a cross section, uh, the Western countries are leading with regard to the development to the industrial revolution and the leading with regard to the happiness revolution. But the two developments are due to, to separate phenomena. It's just that because the same countries lead with regard to both phenomena, you get a, a cross-section relationship. So my view is that the, oh, so many of these uh, uh, studies that say, uh, look, ha happiness is related to income, uh, uh, life expectancy is related to income. They're missing the boat because they don't look at those phenomena historically. They only look at cross-section data. And your second question was? Um, that, that was super helpful. That was, uh, thank you. Uh, the second one, do welfare states do anything else apart from reduce income differences and reduce income volatility? Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> uh, I, I think the, we can't think of the welfare state as a, uh, a and the policies uh, that go with it uh, as a singular phenomenon. Uh, there are many differences among the welfare states, and, and we need to explore uh, those differences to understand better uh, the, uh, the the policies that work and the policies that don't work. But basically. Uh, the emphasis uh, uh, with regard to, to the welfare states is on uh, the welfare of people. Whereas when, when economic growth is the primary concern, the emphasis is on businesses, what can be done uh, to improve uh, business productivity, uh, what can be done to improve uh, the productivity of, of the are the well the the labor force. So uh, the policies that stem uh, from the uh, long-term economic growth are policies that put business in the foreground, and people are just agents of production or something like that. Whereas the policies that the happiness uh, studies put in the foreground put people uh, first. And the, and the concerns of people uh, first. But we still know, know enough about individual policies in the, with regard to the variety of concerns that are most uh, efficient. So the, uh, to talk about the welfare state in a general sense is okay, but the welfare state is not something uh, that we can pre precisely uh, that it's not a singular phenomenon, as I said. Thank you. Yeah, that's. Chris, please go. Well, um, Dick, you may have deconstructed my question now, but it's in the same thread, and I'll try and articulate something um, anyway. So, I it's again on the question, I mean, you could frame this according to the cross-sectional disparity in uh, both income and well-being. Uh, and I suppose the question is, is it possible that 
there are goods that are competitive goods and some that aren't. And so um, let me back up. One of, one of the big implications of, of higher incomes is also that there are more public goods. Uh, and those are in some sense not competitive intrinsically. So they may, you know, if, if they were subject to comparison, they would make no difference. But we're talking about the fact that if policy, if good policy can improve well being. Uh, so that must mean, and our policy costs money, uh, some of it, resource allocation costs money, and that's taken from incomes. And so the richer countries tend to have a higher fraction of their income uh, as uh, going towards public goods, and they also have higher incomes overall to do that with. So is it not possible that most of the, now you've said that we shouldn't put all welfare state policies in one bin, but is it possible that a big part of the difference across countries in happiness is comes from the differences in public goods as opposed to private consumption. Uh, and, and the differences in public goods are due to income? No, but they're facility. No, but but for many of them, they may be facilitated. I mean, you can talk about, you know, causality in the sense that there's different ways to do things. But um, I mean, we have higher trust in richer countries for a reason, right? Enforcement and, and transparency and all these things actually require human resources and expenditure and sizable governments. Um, so it may be that a lot of the public goods, both material and non-material, are aided by uh, well-spent public money. Yes. And that's only possible for, for productive economies. That doesn't mean, yeah. Uh, so uh, I don't. I don't think uh, that uh, investment in uh, the uh, uh, the policies uh, that promote happiness uh, is contingent upon the the level of income of a country. Uh, I think Costa Rica is such a good example. Costa Rica uh, was uh, an early leader with regard to the introduction of uh, policies that improved life expectancy back in the 1920s. That uh, was an early leader uh, with regard to the introduction of welfare state policies in the 1950s. Actually, it uh, started educational policies back in the 1890s. These policies have all been implemented in a country that uh, today has an income level one quarter of that of the United States, but is happier than the United States. So it's a perfect example of how the policies are not dependent on the level income, they're dependent upon public policy, public decisions to, uh, as to how, how, how to direct po pub public policy, uh, whether you're gonna put people's concerns first or public uh, political power, uh, national power. Did that answer your question, Esther? Yes, yes, you did. And I, I think that's a good contradiction for me to reflect on. I, I mean, I suppose my mind is going to end up somewhere in between because some consumption goods like healthcare and um, education and you know many other solutions to collective action problems do require public resources. So you've got to then have yeah, coordination they do, mechanisms. They, they do, but if you, if you look at the policies with regard to uh, health that uh, have, have had a big impact on infant mortality, uh, they didn't require a lot of public resources. Demographers were astounded at, uh, really when you know, it became perfectly clear that uh, you could do an enormous amount uh, to improve uh, infant mortality with a, a, a fairly limited number of, of low expect, expense policies. So I'm not saying that there aren't policies that are expensive uh, and can have an effect. There are policies, but uh, they don't all require a lot of money. And Costa Rica is a perfectly good example of that. Great, thank you. And if I can, I, I do like that question because I think it goes to the heart of debates about how important income and growth are uh, for uh, implementing policies. 
<clears throat> I, let, me, let me just uh, take a moment to add. Uh, see, I think uh, the improvement of life expectancy is another thing that's linked to income uh, mistakenly. Uh, improvement of life expectancy is based upon advances in the life sciences. And it's once the life sciences started to get developed uh, that we implemented, started to implement, and know how to implement policies that would put, provide for uh, the elimination of largely infectious disease. Uh, so uh, there are these different uh, strands of po policy uh, whose origins lie in different segments of the natural and social sciences uh, that uh, provide insight into what's going on today. But we don't teach anything like that in economics, isn't it? Uh, in fact, uh, history is largely eliminated. Not that economic historians ever paid a lot of attention uh, to life expectancy. <clears throat> Um, a quick add-on um, to your great question, Chris, and Dick's very sharp response. Uh, a good counterexample is obviously the United States, where there's an awful lot of money and GDP being spent on healthcare, and um, it's, it's not having the desired effect. And if anything, life, healthy life expectancy has been declining for parts of the population, and quite dramatically so. So, I, I, whereas in other countries, they seem to be doing better with less. So it, 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 there's probably not sort of a, a tandem effect between income growth being required for um, welfare state to be able to develop, to have these public goods and thus raise well-being. It's, it's, it's obviously a more subtle relationship, but um, I, but you probably think that way as well anyway. So yeah. uh, if I can just add to that, uh, 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 the, the health area is a lot like uh, the happiness area. Uh, the European countries uh, have been in the forefront uh, of effective policies with regard to public policies with regard to health, just as they're in the forefront of public policies with regard to happiness. Uh, and uh, Eileen uh, uh, was uh, on, on a committee uh, that produced a report uh, on uh, on. on on life expectancy, uh, and it showed how you know you, you took all the, the, the countries of Europe, uh, Western Europe, uh, and and the United States, and the United States ranked at the bottom on almost any measure of health you could uh, imagine, uh, and I think it may be happiness will end up the same way. <laughs> I, I hope not. For our American friends, I do hope that's, that won't be the case. But... Yeah, well, I, 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 on the other hand, I hope for my European friends that you do to keep up what you're doing and more. <laughs> like your Thank research you. center. Yeah. I'm going to hand over to Andrew Oswald for a next set of questions. May I ask you a difficult question, Dick? Of course. <laughs> well, the, re the rest of them have been really easy. Do you this think is supposed to be a fireside chat, and I feel like my feet are being put to the fire. I think we're enjoying it. Um, do you think that the paradox, your, your paradox, will hold 100 years from now, looking back over that century? And do you, do you think it's inevitable that it would hold, or could we do something about it? Uh, well, uh, we could we could certainly do something about it uh, if uh, uh, the uh, uh, the growth of income uh, was left le less to individual choice and more to public policy that was interested in people's well-being. Uh, so, in that sense, uh, I think uh, uh, income growth uh, could uh, have a positive time series effect uh, on uh, happiness via uh, the implementation uh, of public policies. 
Uh, so I do think uh, that, uh, that we're not, the paradox is not a, you know, a fixed phenomenon. It's, it's uh, how income is spent uh, that's critical to its relationship to happiness. And the idea, uh, especially among economists, is, uh, has to be free choice. Uh, and the consequence of free choice is the Easterlin paradox. Uh, the consequence of understanding these relationships would be to uh, uh, essentially undermine the Easterlin paradox. Good question, Andrew. Uh, we've got some more questions and hopefully we get to them um, within the hour. Uh, first up is Cherise. There. Um, thanks so much for your talk. And um, I'm not part of the Wellbeing Research Center, but um, managed to get in on this chat thanks to Hannah and, and Casper. So uh, thanks for having me. Um, so my question is somewhat similar to the previous question by Andrew Oswald. Um, so in some of your um, writings, you've mentioned that, you know, the UN and the OECD are now advocating for happiness as a policy objective, um, but as a supplement to GDP. And, you know, there's the question of whether or not you can have both as a policy objective, because there is a tension there. And, you know, there's, you've referenced China in your talk how when GDP goes up, happiness tends to go down. But now that we're seeing some of the research that's coming out of um, the Oxford Wellbeing Research uh, Center on how, you know, if we look at, I mean, there's many ways we can intervene in people's lives, but specifically in the workplace, if we focus on happiness of the workers, productivity goes up and that in turn would improve firm performance and then potentially GDP would improve. So I'm wondering is if over time, um, if we if we do make happiness sort of the primary focus of policy objectives, will as a byproduct of that GDP also improve? Uh, uh, well, uh, I think the answer is probably yes, but I, I'm reluctant to say that uh, because GDP uh, so dominates. Uh, public policy considerations and the emphasis on uh, what's important for business so dominates public policy considerations uh, that uh, the, the things that I think are important tend to get swept into the background here in the United States, less, much less so in Europe. Uh, so I think it's useful to preserve the dichotomy between GDP as an index of economic growth and uh, uh, subjective well being measures as indexes of people's welfare and happiness. Uh, and to say it's much more important to focus on uh, the well being measures. And if GDP improves, that's great. Just uh, the opposite of saying, well, let's focus on GDP and maybe people's well being will improve along the way. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, 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 I want to I see people focusing on happiness, not GDP, even though mm -hmm. GDP may benefit uh, somewhat from happiness measures. Thank you. And I think the final question for today, and we're hitting the hour. Danielle, over to you. Yeah, sorry, I see there's only one minute left. Yeah, so thank, thank you again, Richard. Um, I read your paper a while back while I was working at, at Gallup, and it was one of the first that I read on the subject. So some of us do read, do, do read it. Um, my question is, when it when you look at just like you know furthering this agenda in general, do you think that the energy is best spent in the public policy world, um, education, or in workplaces? 
Um, Cause I know I've kind of gone back and forth with, you know, what, what's gonna, what's really gonna push, push this like, you know, the fastest or have the most influence, but it might just be a combination, but what, what's your, what's your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I'm glad you raised that question. Uh, I think uh, one of the, the big omissions in my book is how important work is uh, to people uh, and what, <clears throat> what can be done in the workplace uh, to make uh, people's work more satisfactory. So, excuse me, I, uh, I, I'm... Uh, uh, I don't want to uh, minimize uh, the, the workplace, uh, but the idea is rather than say, what can we do to make the, the work, change the workplace to make business more productive? The question is what can we do to change the workplace to make people happier in their work? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dick. Thank you. Uh, you're you're putting the uh, the your, um, as they say in French, the church back in the middle of the village. Um, we should not <laughs> instrumentalize happiness, productivity, or GDP, but focus on what ultimately matters. Um, wonderful. Well, I think we're definitely past the hour now, and we're ever so much grateful to you, Dick, for taking the time to join us your early morning in Pasadena, Los Angeles. Uh, for us, it's uh, time to go to the pub for a pint. <laughs> and thank you for your patience with my stumbling remarks. And I was wish, wish I were, were going to join you uh, with a glass of wine after, <laughs> after oh. this. But it's a little early here in Los Angeles. <laughs> yes. But hopefully we can get to travel soon again and see each other. Uh, and I think from all of us, just thank you for being such an inspiration and have, having for pretty much single-handedly created the field of happiness economics. Thank um, you, thank you. And, and apologies for putting your toast to the fire. The aim was very much a fireside <laughs> chat <laughs> among friends. So uh, thank, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day and a great weekend. And to all of uh, all the rest of the center and its affiliates, good to see you all and hopefully see you uh, soon again for the next seminar. Thank you. Have and a good keep weekend. up the good work. Will do.